chosen of the peculiar day to meet these four friends. They had green, yellow coats and waterproof pants. One's name was Ali, sat back and sipped some tea. Said today was special, magical, wonderful indeed. They all sat around in acknowledgement, they knew what they'd done. Caught the biggest fish in the ocean, wouldn't have to work from now on. Trolling in the bay. Um, I run a four man charter boat it's called the Hammerhead. It's a 26 foot shamrock. I uh, run out of Keyport, do a lot, of, uh, a lot of bay fishing. We chase the stripers down to the beach, uh, you know, after they leave the bay. But early season, there's a lot of fish in the bay, and it's, a, it's really a lot of fun, and you can do very well. The difference between trolling the bay and trolling the ocean is the depth. We're trolling about 15 feet most of the time in the, uh, in the bay. We troll the edges of the channels, we get a little bit deeper. Um, last year we had a banner year trolling. Reasons why you want to troll, you get to cover a lot of water that you wouldn't normally cover if you were bay fishing. If you were bay fishing and you set up somewhere and you, you chunked or you, uh, you drifted, you're not covering anywhere near the water that you're covering when you're trolling. So that's the, uh, that's one of the advantages of trolling is you get to cover large amounts of water. Um, what we do when we troll, I'm going to go over the plugs first, then we'll go over some of the rigs. Um, as far as the plugs go, everybody knows, everybody's heard, these are stretch 25s. If you troll anything, if you throw any kind of plugs, Mans makes these, these are stretch 25s. They're big lift plugs. These plugs are engineered to troll at about 25 feet deep with 150 feet of 30 pound mono on them. Um, good catch, good lure for using in trolling. Colors, I'm a big blue guy, as you can see by most of my lures, but you can use gold, you can use chartreuse, white, black and, black and pearl. To me, color is really a matter of choice. You know, out of all the variables of the colors of the, of the plugs and all the variables, the, uh, the color is the last variable to me. Um, find a plug that you're comfortable with, find a plug that you have confidence in. Uh, these, are, these are the stretches. This is one made by Bomber, same sort of profile. We had great success with this last year. Be inventive with your plugs. Don't get caught into the same. Don't just get caught into a rut. This is a pike lure. Believe it or not, this lure puts a lot of bass in the boat. We went out one time, we experimented with it, caught fish on it. So good color, uh, different sort of profile, a little bit thicker profile than the stretch. Before you get into the next one, Go ahead. I've seen a double eye uh, hook on the, on the front of that. What is that for? This, adjust, this changes the depth. depth. Okay. Okay, depending on the angle that the lure is getting pulled on, changes the depth. This lure, to fish this lure and the fish like like a, a large profile, like a rattle trap. These lures are engineered with the lips. You know that if you put 150 feet of, of line on them, they're supposed to swim at 25 or 30 feet. These lures are a little bit more touch and feel. You have to fish them, really get to know where they're running and have an idea where they're running. They're a little bit harder to pull than pulling the stretches. But once you use them and you get used to them, you'll know what kind of depths you're running and then it makes it much easier, okay? Also, large profile, bunker kind of profile. This is a rattle trap. This is a, this is a shed wrap by Rapala. It's another lure that we use. Good success within the spring. And with bass, don't be afraid to fish large baits. Okay? This is a Swedish pimple, they call this. This is a real expensive lure. It's about a $30 lure. But don't get turned off by the size because bass will eat any size lure that you put at them. They are aggressive, aggressive feeders. Okay? Is that a top swimming or is it, does it go down? No, this is a deep dive. Look at the lip on it. Yeah, look at the lip on it. That this is a bunker, deeper. right? This is a bunker pattern, yeah, but they do it in a lot of different colors, but this is a bunker pattern. Um, like I said, don't be afraid. I have. the size with the lures when you're trolling for bass guys because bass are you know when they're on the feed they're very aggressive 
Okay. Thing about plugs is the it's the it's all about the depth and it's all about controlling your depth. Okay, and being able to repeat your depth. All right. What we what we've done is this is a little bit of a heavier rod than what you need, but we fish charters. We fish with some people who you know are not fishermen, all you know, real fishermen. So I want to give them a big reel, large arbor, makes it easier for them to reel in and fish. And we use a little bit stiffer rod than what you really need to use if you were fishing on a personal boat. What we what we've done for trolling in the bay with plugs is we've gone to braid. Now these rods are spooled with 150 feet of braid. We fish the braid all the way out. We find if we're touching the bottom, we take a couple turns up, but it gives us a chance to control the depth and repeat, be repetitive in the lure drop. That's why there's only 150 feet of braid in here. This works perfect for trolling in Raritan Bay. It gives us the ability to repeat the depth, which is like, the, you have to be near the bottom if you're bass fishing. You have to get the lure down near the bottom. The bass are feeding under the bluefish. They take the scraps, like Carl was saying in his, uh, in his talk. When the bluefish come in, they're, they're much more aggressive than the bass. They'll come in, they'll beat up a school of bunker. They attack from the back, which is what Carl said. The heads and the front pieces tend to drop. That's what the bass will eat. The bass will also eat the school stragglers. That's why you want to be down the bottom. You want to be below the bluefish. Super important to get near the bottom. This 150 foot of braid in the bay gives you the, gives you the ability to get the lure down near the bottom and to repeat the depth with consistency. And that's really what you have to do. Okay, that's what we troll with plugs. That's a lever drag. It's a pretty stiff rod. It's a 15 to 30 rod but it does the drag trick. It's a little bit of an overkill. If I was on a private boat and I was doing it myself, you could step down to a rod like this. This is a 15 to 25 rod. It's a little bit lighter, a little bit longer, okay? The longer the rod, it's a little bit harder to carry the fish and land the fish. We want a shorter rod. People just step backwards. They bring the line right to, this, right to the edge. It's easy for us to handle the fish on the shorter rods. This fish, on a private boat, a little bit more fun, you know, have a little bit better time at it. You don't need the large reel. This is an Abbott. This is a MXL. It's a lever drag also. If you want to have a little bit more fun, this is the way to go. But like I said, when we're chartering, we want the fish in the boat. And we've got, we have to make sure that the people can handle the fish. That's why a little bit larger harbor. One crank, they get more line. And a little bit stiffer rod tires, tires the fish out a little bit more. But this is something I would use if I was on, on my own boat having a little bit of fun. Okay. Talk a little bit about rigs now. This is a tube rig. Simulate sand deals. Very productive rigs. We do very well with these. This is a little bit different style. Uh, eel rig, tube rig. This has the real good company. What makes these special is if you know most umbrella rigs, the wires are flat. The way that this is raked simulates a school of fish much better than a lot of the other umbrella rigs. Okay, the inside, the inside teasers or the blades, there's no hooks on these. Okay, there's only hooks on the outside and the trail, and the trail work. The reason for that is you can do multiple hookups with these rigs, and you don't want to have, it's bad enough when you get two bass or two bluefish on a boat at one time, you don't want to have 10 hooks on here and end up with four or five fish on at one time. It's a good problem to have. No, it's a good, it's a good problem, but it's a problem just the same. All right, so the, like I said, trailer, outside outside lures all have hooks, all the inside stuff is, is uh, is all teasers, okay? One style with the willow blades, one style with all tubes, okay? Colors, I'm big on black, I'm big on black and red, and I really like the white. There's chartreuse, there's orange, there's green. Color to me is a matter of preference. I've had luck 
and I have confidence in these colors, that's why I use them. Beauty of these, if the green-eyed demons come around, which are bluefish, for anybody that doesn't know them by that name, this lure does not get ruined by a bluefish. It takes a lot of bites on the, on the surgical tube for the bluefish to tear up the tube. Okay? Got to get down to the bottom with those. I'll go over what rods we use for these. These we fish off a wire. Okay? The other rig that we use, everybody's heard of, is the shad rigs. Okay? Now, this is maybe a 13 shad rig. Okay? You need a rod to pull this, first of all. I'll show you the rod. We fish these on wires also. This goes by, there's no doubt that this looks like a school of bait fish when it's coming by you. It's, uh, it's a proven method to catch fish. It's a little bit hard. You know, you get one or two, you get two fish on this or one fish, don't forget, you have the weight of the rig, you have the weight of the fish. It's a little bit harder, it's not quite as sporty. But if you want to get in the strike zone and have a chance to catch fish, these rigs definitely work. Color-wise with these, I, I didn't want to bring all the rigs, but you know, this is blue and white we use. This is a red one that we had custom made a couple years ago. This is like a fluorescent red. Uh, kind of, they tell me it looks like a porgy, you know, when the, when the bait fish are around. This is, we have one or two rigs with this. We use this a lot. This is called dolphin. Is blue and chartreuse. Okay, we use this color a real lot also. And then I don't have it rigged on here, but a lot of times with these rigs, what we do is we take a nine inch and we rig a nine inch on the trailer. Okay, bass, the bass eating is all a matter of risk and reward. Okay, They're, they want to spend the least amount of energy to get the biggest, biggest uh, bait, that, the biggest feed that they can. So we pull the nine inch off the trail of a lot of these shed rigs and the trail, the trail hook gets hit probably 70% of the time. That's because it's in the back, right? Partly in the back, but partly because it's the bigger bait. Bigger fish. Looks like the straggler, which is one reason, but it's for the effort. They're gonna get more for their, more for their effort. They're gonna get more to eat. And that's why the nine inch on the trailer is a real good thing. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Hey, how fast you go? How fast you going with the boat? We're gonna get into that. Yeah, yeah. I want to go over the rods first, and then I'll get into boat speed and stuff like that. Okay. So for the rigs, for the rigs, guys, what you have to do is you have to use a much heavier rod, much much longer rod. These are eight footers. This reel right here is spooled with 150 foot of 40 pound stainless wire. We have. This one probably has about 16 feet of 60 pound mono attached to the wire. We tie this direct to the rig. Sometimes if, if we're changing a lot and we're not in a pattern that we really like, we'll put a big, we'll put a big snap swivel on here and we'll change out. It makes it to change out easier. But the less hardware, the less things that can go wrong. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of hardware. I'd rather tie direct to it than, uh, than put a bunch more hardware on there. But if we have to, if we're changing out a lot, or if we're not quite sure what's going on yet, we'll put a swivel on here. It makes the change out much easier. This is a PEN 113 HSP. This is a reel that's made for wire line. The wire gives you the depth, okay? Um, 150 feet of wire, they tell you, is, gives you 15 feet of depth. There's 150 feet of wire on this reel. Same thing. We dumped the whole 150 feet. With the uh, with the extra weight of this, we're getting more than the 15. So then we take up a couple turns on the wire. Okay. Again, figure out the depth. Figure out where where you are, and you have to be able to repeat the depth. If you hook up, you have to be able to repeat the depth. One of them most important things and, and some of the silliest things that fishermen do are not be able to repeat the depth. They put the line out, they, it's out there, they don't know how much, they count seconds, they do, you know, if the boat's rolling with the tide, against the tide, the sec, oh, none of that's going to get you in the same spot. 150 feet of wire, we dump all 150 and start cranking up till we know we're off the bottom. Once we're off the bottom, 
Now we may only have two turns of wire or three turns of wire on here, so we can repeat that depth pretty, pretty easily just by knowing how many turns of wire we got on the reel pump if we don't have the whole 15, 150 feet out. Okay, this is a rod by, made by Star. I'm on the Star Rod Pro staff, guys. I use all Star Rods, so every rod you see up here is a Star. They're great rods. They make a variety of rods for salt water. Um, for the cost, they're one of the best production rods made as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I'm a big proponent of their rods. This reel is made for wire line, has a brass spool chromed over so that the wire line doesn't eat up the spool. Again, this is a Pen 113 HSP. Okay. Then for trolling, for trolling the shad rigs, it's a lot, a lot of weight. You know, you have 13, 13 of these shad bodies dragging behind you all, you know, dancing in the water. But this rod is what, this is almost a tree stump, this rod. This rod has tons of backbone, but it'll handle that 13, that 13 rig shad rig. Okay? This rod right here is same rod, it's a star rod, it's a different model, it's a little bit heavier rod. Same reel, 113 pen. This reel has 300 feet of wire on it, because I actually use these rods out in the ocean. Now what I have in here to have the depth mark, uh, if you come up later I'll be able to show you. This has colored telephone wire wrapped in around the stainless steel at 50 foot intervals. Different colors, different depths. Now, I'm not a rocket scientist, so I don't remember what color is where. <laughs> so I have, I have tags on the side of the reel that tells me when I see the black one, I'm in 50 feet. The green one, I'm 100 feet in. The white one, I'm 150. The brown, I'm 200. And the red, I'm 250. So I know what colors I have, so I know which, how much wire is in the water. Again, repetitive depth. I have to be able to repeat the depth if I hook up. So that's why the different colors are on here. That's, and like I said, I don't use these reels every day so I don't remember the colors. So I have them tagged right on the side of the reel. All right? All right, the next thing you're drawing from a boat is I recommend highly some sort of rod riggers. Okay, these actually drop in the rod holders. All right, drop in the rod holders. They hold the rods, the rod slides into them. What this does is, if you have a 10 foot wide beam on a boat, or like my boat, my boat's only an eight foot six beam. If I'm not fishing with riggers, my baits are trolling, are real close together. If I go into a turn or, or I get a, a wave action or something like that, my baits could cross. If I have to slow down because somebody's crossing me or whatever. What the rod riggers does, they give you the ability. Now, now I've each of these is out on, on the eight foot. I put an eight foot rod in them. Now my rods are my baits are trolling at 24 feet apart, tip to tip, as opposed to eight feet apart if I didn't have a rod holder. Okay. Plus, when you're trolling, you get the true depth. If you have the rod standing right up in a rod holder, you may not get the true depth that the that the lure is engineered for. So the riggers, there's, these are old riggers. These are what we use. But now they have flip-up riggers. They have, you know, and it makes it easier to pull the rod out. Because with the rigger like this, you have to lean over the boat, slide the rod out, and get the fish to fight. Now they make flip-up. They make ones that the rod can, comes out much more easily. When you are trolling, you're trolling with expensive rods and reels. Don't cheat. This is a lanyard. I have eyes screwed into the gunnel on my boat. This rigger goes into the boat, this lanyard goes onto the eye. I also have a four foot long lanyard or six foot long lanyard that goes from that eye into this rod, into this reel. It's happened. Rod slides out, they drop the rod trying to take it out of the rod holder. You get a wave, tips the rod tip into the water, wants to take the rod out of the boat. I'm not looking to give up a $400 setup 
because of a wave or because somebody didn't know what they were doing. So I have lanyards, I have brass eyes on them, I lock everything in. Everything is attached all the time until the angler gets the rod in their hand. Once we're sure they're comfortable, we'll take the lanyard off and we'll let them fight the fish. Okay? Difference between, this is a star drag. Difference between star drag and lever drag. Lever drag you could set to the strike force that you want. When we troll, we troll with the drag heavy enough to stop the bait from pulling out while we're trolling. But we don't want the drag set at full on full. We want the fish to be able to hit and take drag. With the lever, once you have the rod in your hand and you have the fish under control, you just move it up to the strike position. Now you're fighting the fish at the preset drag. With a star drag, you have to adjust the drag as you go. And that's where Paul and I come in because you know we have to adjust after the fish has been bow after the fish has been hooked and it's really kind of feel work what you're doing. That's why the lever drags are nicer for that kind of uh, for that kind of fishing. We haven't found a lever drag yet that'll hold up to the wire trolling line. So as soon as we do, we're gonna switch over to lever drags with the wire trolling. Okay. Okay, the next thing, we talked about repetitive depth, okay, the next thing we want to do is talk about boat speed, because that's going to affect your depth also. Bass, although they can be aggressive feeders, they're basically lazy fish. Ideal trolling speed for bass is under three knots. True all the time, maybe, I don't know. You want to start somewhere around the three knot mark. What we like to do is, if you're trolling with the current, across the current, or against the current, your speed over ground, which is what you're reading on your GPS, is not going to give you the true reading of what the water is doing and what the lure is doing behind you. So what we try to do is, I'll have Paul, I'll set the boat at, a, at say, two and a half knots. I'll have Paul drop the rod in the water. We'll put the lure back until we see the action that the lure is running at. And we'll try to adjust to get the action of the lure where we want it to be. Once we know that, in that direction, we'll hold that speed and we'll drop the lure back into 150 feet. With these, there's not as much action of the lure that you're worried about, so we always start around that two and a half or three knot. Okay? Couple things. That's the speed you want to be at, and that's the speed you really want to maintain. But varying the speed sometimes will trigger a strike. Okay? Trolling, trolling in a straight line, two and a half knots. Every once in a while, I'll take the boat, I'll bump it out of gear. What will happen? The plugs are floaters. They'll flutter, and they'll float. These rigs will drop. Then I'll bump the boat back into gear. Sometimes, just by changing the speed and just having that hesitation in the lure will trigger a strike. So you do want to vary the speeds. You don't want to vary the speeds tremendously, but you want to, you want to put a little bit of uh, irregularity into the troll. You want to change speed, you want to bump it up. You want, if you go on a turn, the, the rod that's on the outside of the turn, that lure will speed up. The lure that's on the inside of the turn will slow down. Okay, so what will happen is if you're trolling a rig and we're on the and we start to make a turn, the outside rig will speed up, the inside rig will probably fall a little bit because the speed is going to reduce by virtue of being on the inside of the turn. So sometimes you just want to go and you just want to grab the wheel and you just want to put some irregularity in the troll. Don't just troll a beeline. Put some put some turns in it. It'll change the speeds without doing anything to the throttle or taking it in or out of gear. You can change speed just by changing the course of the boat. Okay? We started to talk about it a little bit before. I'll go into it a little more. Tide, wind direction, and current are all going to affect the speeds that you're trolling at. Okay? If you're trolling with the tide, you have a following sea. What you're trolling over ground is going to be diminished 
because of the speed of the water behind you coming in the same direction. So now that two and a half or three knots may not be good enough for you. You may have to go to three and a half or four knots. Okay? If you're trolling across the tide, you'll get different action in the lures. Okay? If the boat is trolling in the wind, I'll be at the same RPMs, but I won't get the speed by virtue of the wind blowing up against the boat, acting as a sail. We'll slow down. So I'll have to increase the RPMs or increase the speed. Plus, if I'm trolling against the current, the water is moving faster, so the lure is going to, even though my speed over ground is going to be two and a half knots, in the water the lure is going to be moving much faster because the speed of the tide that's running against the, uh, running against the plug is going to actually make the plug be working in four knot water, or four and a half knot water. So that all, and that all comes from experience. There's no, I can tell you about it, you could read about it, you could look up whatever you want, but the truth is the experience on the water is going to be, I can tell, I can help you, but your experience and, and is going to tell you, you're, yeah, excuse me, start over. <laughs> There's no substitute for experience. So the experience that you that you have on the water, that's gonna tell you if your rod or your lure or your boat is running, what you have to do to it against the wind, with the wind, or with the tide or against the tide. So there's no substitute for experience. Um, Just a quick question. Yeah, go. Uh, how, um, on those umbrella rigs, you have so much weight on them, how do you tell when you're actually hitting bottom and then cranked in or so? Well, what do you expect in the field? It's a, it's it's kind of a different bump. All right, if if this thing hits bottom, you'll see the rod, it'll like bang and okay. come up. Okay. Some of the rods, from knowing the rods, we'll see if we if we bang and come up like that, we'll notice the load on the rod. We'll be but we've been doing it so long, but you'll notice an additional load on the rod, and then we'll reel it in and check it. So you're never pulling your line to check it. You're just watching the tail. No, I'm yeah. pulling the lines to check it. Yeah. I'm not. That's going to bring me to another point. Okay. A lot of guys put these rods out in the water. They put the lures on. They put the rigs on. They open the beer. One guy's driving the boat and two guys are shooting the breeze. Yeah. Nobody's watching the rods. <laughs> okay. If you're where you're supposed to be with these lures and these rigs, you got to be down the bottom. Somebody has to keep an eye on the rods. When we're pulling plugs, these rods, we know we're going to have a twitch in the rod, constant. Yeah. If we see that twitch stop, we know we grab the bag, we grab the piece of seaweed, we grab the muscle shell, we know. But if you don't know, you have to reel them in every 15 minutes max, okay. have a look at them, put them in. If you catch a piece of seaweed and you're dragging a piece of seaweed on that plug, the action's going to stop and there's not a fish in the world that's going to hit that plug with a piece of seaweed on it. So don't troll for hours and hours without checking your rods and checking your, seeing what's going on out there. You can't do it. And that's a cardinal sin that a lot of guys, I fish with a lot of guys who think they're fishing and they're sitting talking and shooting a breeze, nobody's watching the rod. You can't fish like that. Well, you have to keep your eye on the rod at all times. Are you adjusting your depth all the time if you're going, you know, let's say... We try, it? no, see, no. We, we try not to do that. When we try to troll, I try to troll on a constant depth. Gotcha. Now, I'm not saying I'll stay at that depth all day, yeah. but if we're, if we're set and we're comfortable, say we got the 150 foot of braid in the water and the plug in the water, and I know we're running a 20 foot contour line, mm -hmm. I'll try to stay on that 20 foot contour line while we are set like that. I won't go, I won't run a 20 foot contour line, jump up to a 25 contour, foot contour line, tell them to drop out some more line, go back to a 15 foot contour line, reel it in. We won't do that. Once we set and we're on a troll, we're going to hold a contour line or we're going to try to hold a constant depth for that troll. If nothing happens there, next set we might go to. 15 feet or next time we might go into 25 feet and then we'll adjust we'll put the lures out till we know we're close to the bottom on a 20 foot contour or 25 foot contour and then we'll troll that contour line we don't we don't reel in and let out as we're going because again you 
the depth and the consistency of the being of the depth is so important, and we won't know what we're doing if we're reeling up, putting down, reeling up, putting down. We, we, even if we get a hit, we won't know where that lure was when it got hit. You know, I can't expect them to count five turns up or six turns down or four. You know, we can't. It, it, it just gets too complicated. We really want to know wh what depth the lure is running. So I'll stay on the contour. Okay. If, if you're trolling and you happen to catch fish, okay, what I do, the minute we hook up a fish, I hit the man overboard one. I put that spot into my depth finder immediately. I also keep my track lines on my, on my GPS. We hit a fish, I mark the spot, we'll keep on the troll. We hit another fish, we'll mark the spot, we'll stay on the troll. We get another one, we'll mark the spot, we'll stay on the troll. If, if we have caught two or three fish in, I don't know, maybe a mile distance, a mile and a half distance, and then we don't get a hit, we won't keep on that troll. We had some success, <coughs> we will now troll back to where we had the fish. I have the marks on the machine. I have the track on the machine. We're gonna go back over. Second time through, we may go a different direction. Say we were going east-west, and we hit the fish. We'll come back through west to east to see if there's any difference or to see what's going on. There are days when every single hit comes in a north-south direction or every single hit comes in an east-west direction. Once we establish that pattern of east-west or north-south, we will troll. When we get done with that troll, reels come in, engines go up, make a big circle, we come back, we get on the same, on the same track and on the same pattern. We won't even waste time trolling a different direction next time through. Once we feel that we know the pattern and we have the fish, we won't waste time trolling in another direction. We'll just pick up, come right back to where we started, drop them in the water again, and go. We had times last year <laughs> where we had such consistent fishing in Araran Bay on this one line, on one tide, and one line on another tide, that we almost wore out our stupid GPS. We did not have, we, we could go and on that, them fish were there for two weeks. If it was low, if it was high tide, they were in on a shallower contour line. We trolled east to west. If it was high tide, if it was low tide, they moved a little bit deeper, and we were trolling northeast to southwest. And the marks that we had in the machine, he'll tell you. I mean, I would tell people, here they come, and we would drive over that mark. We'd be a hundred feet past that mark, and we would hook up. And it was that consistent last year. It was like, it was amazing. It was amazing. But the point being, once you, once you establish a pattern and once you have an idea where the fish are and what's going on, don't waste time doing other things. Do what, do what was productive for you and do it till it stops. That bite may only last three or four passes, okay? Once it dies, don't stay there the rest of the day saying, oh, they were here, they were here, they were here. Either they moved off with the tide, or they turned off, they're not eating in there right now. Something changed to make them fish stop eating. So don't stay there. Now go off and explore. That's the beauty of trolling. Now I'm gonna be somewhere else, and I'm gonna be looking for fish again. Okay, same thing with colors, okay? I have favorite colors. Why are they my favorite colors? Because I've developed confidence in them over the years, all right? This is a bomb. This is one of my favorite colors for fish in the bay, bar none. Last year, we, we killed fish on this color. But if I'm throwing in this color, I will always troll a second color, different color. But if I catch two fish on this color and no fish on the other color, that color's coming off. And either I'm putting this color on or at least I'm gonna try a different color, okay? If this fish, if this color is not catching, and I'm catching on a, on a black and pearl or something like that, you know, there's days where they don't bite this, and this one's producing, I'm gonna change the colors, and I'm gonna go to this color. 
you, you have to be, you have to experiment, you have to change colors, you have to be able to, uh, to make some changes to increase your chances of catching fish. Like I said, to me, color is the last variable, but there, it makes a difference some days. So be willing to change. And if, some, if you've been dragging a color for four hours and it hasn't caught a fish, change the colors, do something, change the profile. Do something to change that lure up to increase your chances. Um, once we zero in on, on color, a direction, and pattern, both rods get the same lure on it. We troll the same direction the rest of the, not the rest of the day, but till that bite dies on that pattern in that direction. Once it dies, then we'll, then we'll go somewhere else. We'll try something different. We'll put a different color rig on. We'll try a different direction. We'll try to do something different. But while it's being successful, we don't waste time. We don't waste time. We're here to catch some fish. So when, when we're being successful, we make sure that we can copy, we can copy the root. We can copy the depth. You have to be able to do that in order to put, maximize the amount of fish that you put in a boat. And the depth is the first thing, but the root is the second thing. Sometimes there's a, we, I had a spot in a boat last year that on a depth finder, there was no structure. It was a flat spot, but it marked fish. And I don't know if it was a muscle bed. I don't know what was there that was holding those fish on that spot, but we found it by accident. We were trolling, I, we read the fish, we, we hooked up, I hit the button, we marked the spot, and that spot held fish for two weeks. And I still don't know, I don't know what was there. I have no idea what was there, but for some reason those fish were on that spot. And bass orient to structure, or bass orient to muscle beds, or ba bass don't just sit in the middle of the, of the water. Bass are there for a reason. So there was something holding them bass on that spot. And it was so consistent, it, it, it was like it was like taking bass in a goldfish. What else are you looking for on, you know, your your, your ground level? Are you always trying to be on a ridge? Are you trying to go through poles? Or? We we start we start on contour lines. Yeah. So yeah. if we have a if we have perfect example, I don't know if you know Round Bay. Well, Round Bay has a big thing called Round Troll. Okay. Round Troll is it's basically round. That's why they call it. There's a it's 14 to 15, it's 17, 18 feet, it rides up to 14 feet. Contour line. We, we troll that contour line pretty hard. Okay, so what it is, is it, it's a change in the depth. It's giving the bass something to orient on, you know, some structure to orient on. They're going to sit on the ridge or they're going to sit up on top of it, but it gives them something to orient on. And we look for places like that to troll. So we don't always just, looking for a drop or a fall we, and, and a good path to go. We, that's what we look for. Yeah. But I'm telling you, this spot last year was in the middle of nothing. It was dead flat. <laughs> it was dead flat. We happened to drive over by accident. We were going from one spot to another spot. We didn't want to pick the rods up because we didn't know where to fish. We ran over the spot. We marked it. And like I said, there were fish there for two weeks. And it was, it was a flat, I'm telling you, a flat spot. 300 yards off the channel. And those fish moved from that spot at the low tide, because it was a little bit deeper water, up until an edge break at, at high tide. And depending on the tide, we either had those fish on the edge break or we had the fish in that spot. And I, when I'm telling you we put over 200 fish in the boat on, on in the same same two square mile area, we put 200 bass in the boat last year. You know, and not, not big fish, but you know, a lot of teenagers, a lot of 17, 18 pound fish, you know, some small fish, but a lot, a lot of fish. And it, like I said, we just had a spot, them fish held it, we happened to mark it, we knew they were there, we knew what direction we trolled them. We had guys out, we were taking, we were doing half days, 3.30 to 7.30. We were putting 12 fish in the boat. And a four, on a four-hour trip after work for guys. They were coming home with, you know, not all of them were keepers maybe, but they were coming home, four guys, three guys with five, six fish in four hours. You know, it, it was, the bay was very, 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 all I got. Um, Quick question. Go ahead. 
I hear a lot of guys complain about using wire because of the backs and whatnot. Do you hear that complaint a lot? What do you mean the backs? You know, it's 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 a stiffer type of fishing. Hey, you know, I'm t when I first started, yeah, I laughed at guys that fish with wire. I mean, they use it a lot at Montauk. I know that. It's if you want to get to where the fish are, yeah, you need the wire. You need wire. Yeah. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna try this year. We just started using the braid on the plugs two years ago. Mm -hmm. We were using mono for the on the braid on the plugs. We just started the braid on the plugs a couple years ago. I'm gonna actually try some of the some of the heavier braid, maybe 80. Yep. To try to pull some of the rigs on 80, sure. just to make it a little bit more fun. Mm -hmm. A lot of things can go wrong with the wire, um, especially when you have novice fishermen on the boat. You know, everybody everybody tends to go like this and pump the rod when they're reeling in the fish. Mm -hmm. If you do that with wire, what happens is the wire will jump over the top of itself. Yes. You're done. You're done. Or it kinks the wire. That's kinks it. Break. You get you get a runoff. And you don't have the drag set right. Over you get a bird's mouth in the wire. Forget it. You're not getting it. You're not even going to pretend to get it out. You're going to pull a 150 foot or 300 foot of wire off, and you're going to retie with new wire, and you're going to put it on. Nightmare. So yeah, it's a nightmare. And we still fish with stainless. A lot of guys fish with Monel, which is a much softer wire. It, it, there's some forgiveness in it. We still fish with stainless, so if you get a gink in the stainless, that it, the gink is there forever. All right, couple, just a couple more points, guys. Um, where's the troll? Keep a pocket full of tickers when you're in the back of the boat for the guys that cross. <laughs> yeah. All right, we tie the way that the way that we rig. This is an old lure. This lure, as you. As you can tell, guys, my boat got damaged by Sandy. My house got damaged by Sandy, so I'm a little bit behind the eight ball here. But like this lure hasn't come off the boat, it hasn't been taken off or cleaned or anything. Okay, what we do from the end of the braid, we're running about six or eight feet on a heavy barrel swivel. This is I don't I don't necessarily use fluorocarbon when we're trolling because them fish are in any in any mood if they're going to chase. So this is probably 40 pound. Uh, just mono, okay? We tie the knot. We don't use a knot between the braid. I'm not going to be able to get this all out for you. But we don't use a swivel between the braid and the, and the mono backer. The backer we use 60 pounds because if we have that all the line in the water, plus you have a big fish on, we don't want to lose anything. So we got 60 pound mono for the backing here. We tie a knot. It's kind of my own knot. I. You know, I don't know. I learned to tie the right knot, and then I forgot. So I just kind of developed my own knot. And really what it is, I'll tie it for you at the end if anybody wants to see it. It's a, uh, it's like a double improved clinch knot. And what it does is I tie an improved clinch knot on the braid and an improved clinch on the, uh, on the backer. And what happens is it ends up being a jam knot. You have to, the, the one knot on this on this side. You have the one knot on the braid and the one knot on the uh, mono. And when you pull them down, they actually turn into a jam knot and they jam each other. Um, never broke a fish off on that knot. So it's a real it's a real good knot to know. On the mono, I mean on the. I have dacron. I have 80 pound dacron on some of these, and I have heavy mono on the other backers to the wire. What you want to tie with that is it's, it's basically an Albright knot. Is the connection between the, the wire and the uh, and the bat, whatever you're using for your backing. And then what I'm using what I'm using between the stainless and the leader is it's just become so easy. Those little skinny spro wind on swivels it, they wind right through the eyes. Very you know very very easy to, to you don't have to worry about a knot. You can cut off. And not worry about what's going on. So we've been using the spro wind on swivels for that last connection. The other thing you want to know about the rods is if you're fishing wire, these rods all have carboloid guides. They're uh, you know they're hardened steel. The wire won't put a rut in these. It won't you know if you run wire through a through a silicone guy or through a ceramic guy, that wire eventually will cut into the eye. So you can't use them. You have to use a carboloid eye.